two decades ago, I was walking by an old dilapidated building on Capitol Hill and God gave me a vision. He said, this crack house would make a great coffee house. The problem is our church had very little money and very few people. So for five years, we circled that property in prayer. We finally purchased that piece of promised land in 2002. And in 2006, that crack house turned into Ebenezer's Coffee House. It's been voted the number one coffee house in Washington, D.C. We've served more than a million customers and given more than a million dollars in net profits to kingdom causes. The rooftop of Ebenezer's is one of my favorite places to pray. When you pray in a place where God has already done a miracle, it's hard not to have faith. Here's what I believe. Prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. Prayer is the difference between you fighting for God and God fighting for you. And in this instance, prayer is the difference between a crack house and a coffee house. Over the next 40 days, we're gonna dream big, pray hard, and think long. We're gonna pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on us. And I believe God is gonna show up and show off His grace and His goodness in your life. Well, welcome to the 40 Day Prayer Challenge. It's time to draw the circle. In 1996, I was a rookie pastor. National Community Church was meeting in a DC public school. Our average attendance was two dozen people. And I had just started reading through the book of Joshua. I got to verse three in chapter one, and a promise jumped off the page and into my spirit. Here's what it says. I will give you every place you set your foot, just as I promised Moses. When I read that verse, I felt like God was prompting me to pray a circle all the way around Capitol Hill. It was a hot and humid August day, so it would have been much easier to stay in the air conditioning, but I felt like I needed to take a step of faith. So I did a 4.7 mile prayer walk all the way around the perimeter of Capitol Hill. And I share that story in the Circle Maker series, the prequel to Draw the Circle, but God has done even more miracles in the last few years. So let me give you an update. Honestly, I wasn't even praying for property. I had no idea 20 years later, we'd be one church with eight campuses. I had no idea that God would entrust us with not just Ebenezer's Coffee House, but half a dozen properties worth more than $50 million. And it's no coincidence that all of them are right on that prayer circle, including a $29 million castle on Capitol Hill that I'll tell you about in session two. Now let me go back to that promise. Over the next five weeks, we're going to dream big, pray hard, and think long. We're gonna circle the promises of God in prayer. I wanna use the book of Joshua as our backdrop, and it starts with the first promise in the first chapter. I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised Moses. I know there are those who would say, Mark, this promise was for Joshua, not you. And I understand that. The last thing I wanna do is take the promises of God out of context. But let me push back on this point. This promise wasn't for Joshua in the first place. It was for Moses, but God transferred that promise. There is a transitive property to the promises of God. In fact, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Our problem is not over-believing the promises of God. Our problem is failing to stake claim to the promises God has given us. 
Jeremiah 1 says that God is watching over his word to perform it. Isaiah 55 says his word does not return void. He wants to deliver on his promises, but we have to circle them in prayer. Before we do, let me lay down some ground rules at the beginning of this study. First of all, God is not a genie in a bottle. Our wish is not his command. This isn't about outlining our agenda to God. Prayer is about getting into the presence of God and the word of God and discerning his agenda for us. Here's a twofold litmus test. Our prayers have gotta be in the will of God and for the glory of God. This is not about what we want. This is about what God wants. Sometimes the circumstances we're asking God to change are the very circumstances that God is using to change us. This isn't about praying away our problems. This isn't about name it, claim it. This is all about God's will and God's glory. It's about praying the price. It's about praying like it depends on God and working like it depends on us. Here's what I know for sure. God won't answer 100% of the prayers you don't pray. We began this session on the rooftop at Ebenezer's Coffee House. Honestly, we shouldn't own that piece of property. Four parties offered more money for it than we did, two of them real estate developers. So how did we get it? Well, I only have one answer and it's Matthew 18, 18. It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The word bind is a legal term. It's a contractual word. Prayer is the way we put contracts on things in the spiritual realm. Again, it's gotta be in the will of God and for the glory of God. But if it is, all authority in heaven and on earth is ours in Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And by the way, mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Those are two different things. It's a double blessing. And it starts with a holy confidence in a God who hears and answers prayer. In the Circle Maker series, I share the story of Honey the Circle Maker. So I'll give you the short version here. In the first century BC, a drought threatened to destroy a nation to destroy a generation. According to the Talmud, there was a righteous man named Honey who had faith like Elijah. The people asked him to pray for rain, but Honey didn't just pray. He drew a circle in the sand, he stepped inside that circle, he knelt down, and he prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. That's a bold prayer. If God doesn't answer that prayer, you're gonna be in that circle a long time. But here's what I believe. I believe God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. At first, the Sanhedrin took issue with his prayer. They thought it was too bold, but it's hard to argue with a miracle. Ultimately, Honey was honored for the prayer that saved a generation. That's the power of a single prayer, and that's what this series is all about. Over the next 40 days, I wanna challenge you to pray some bold prayers, but let me answer a few questions up front. Why 40 days? Well, there isn't anything magical about 40 days, but there is something biblical about it. The flood lasted 40 days. Moses went up on Mount Sinai for 40 days. The 12 spies did reconnaissance in the promised land for 40 days. Nineveh was given 40 days to repent. And of course, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. So pick a start date. It could be your birthday or a holiday. You could leverage Lent or New Year. Pick a date, any date, then pray every day for 40 days. Here's what I'm getting at. 
God doesn't do things on our timeline. And in my experience, whatever you're believing God for will probably take longer than you anticipate. This isn't about giving God a 40-day deadline. This is about asking and seeking and knocking, Matthew 7, 7. Those are present imperative verbs. In other words, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and keep circling. I think we give up too quickly and too easily. In the next session, I wanna share what may be the most miraculous answer to prayer I've ever experienced. And it didn't take 40 days, it took 40 years. The goal of this challenge isn't praying for 40 days. The goal is establishing a prayer habit so we're still praying on day 41. Let me give you a picture. The circle maker ends and draw the circle begins with a story about Gypsy Smith. He was born on the outskirts of London in 1860, powerfully used by God, crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean 45 times preaching the gospel to millions of people in America. He wasn't formally educated, yet he lectured at Harvard. He was even invited by two presidents to the White House. Well, one day, Gypsy was preaching a revival, and a group of people set up a meeting with him. They asked him how they could be used by God the way God had used him. They wanted to know how they could make a difference with their lives the way Gypsy had with his. His answer was pretty simple, pretty profound. And it's as true today as it was a hundred years ago. Gypsy Smith said, go home, lock yourself in your bedroom, then kneel down in the middle of the floor and with a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself. There on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival within that circle. Over the next 40 days, that's what we're gonna do. I don't think it has to be a literal circle. I don't think you have to lock yourself in your bedroom, but I do wanna challenge you to find a time and find a place. It might be setting your alarm clock an hour earlier for 40 days. It might be leveraging your commute or your lunch hour, but whatever you do, find a time and find a place. You know, maybe it's kneeling next to your bed at the end of the day. It could be someplace like the rooftop at Ebenezer's where you pace and pray. But whatever you do, find a place. I have several places in DC that have become holy ground to me. For 13 years, our church met in the movie theaters at Union Station. There's a pillar right outside the station where I would go and pray on Saturday nights. After we built Ebenezer's Coffee House, the rooftop became my favorite place to pray. And in session three, I'll show you the Senate fountain that has become holy ground to me. But it doesn't have to be someplace exotic. During one of our 40-day prayer challenges at National Community Church, we landed on 7.14 a.m. as a corporate prayer time. We actually sent a text reminder every morning, and we asked our church to kneel and pray wherever they were. I remember kneeling in some pretty crazy places, including an airport. More often than not, I'd kneel next to my bed or in my office. One way or the other, find a time, find a place, and then finally, pick a problem or a promise or even a person. You need to pray about what to pray about. Again, this isn't about our agenda for God. This is about getting into God's presence and discerning His agenda for us. And so the question is, what's your Jericho? That's what you have to figure out. It might be your marriage. It could be a child that's in a tough spot. It could be a goal, like my goal of writing a book. It could be a promise God gave you a long time ago 
and you need to recircle it. Or it could even be an addiction that you need deliverance from. Here's what I want you to do. After you pray about it, write it down in your study guide and then circle it. I've heard some amazing stories from people who have taken this prayer challenge. I think of Paul Anderson who circled the hospital 350 times or the chaplain of the Golden State Warriors who circled the court before they won their most recent championship. There are members of Congress circling the Capitol. There are teachers circling classrooms, real estate developers circling properties, coaches circling stadiums, and youth groups circling schools. One of my favorite stories is about the guy who was circling his bank believing for a financial miracle. That is until the cop showed up and asked him what he was doing. Be careful what you circle. Remember, it's got to be in the will of God and for the glory of God. But if it is, keep circling. One last challenge. Find a time, find a place, and find a friend. Prayer is a team sport. Don't do this study all by yourself. I love the story of Moses and the battle of Rephidim. The Bible says that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But when his hands grew tired, the tide turned and the Israelites began losing the battle. That's when Aaron and Hur, one on one side and one on the other side, hold up Moses' arms until sunset. It's this beautiful picture of prayer. We need people to lift us up in prayer. We need prayer partners. We need spotters, people who lift our burdens to the Lord when our faith isn't strong enough. We need people who intercede for us, people in our prayer corner. Maybe it's your spouse. It could be a friend or a colleague. It might be your small group. But don't do this alone. There is power in agreement. Right after he says, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, Jesus says this, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. One plus one doesn't equal two in that prayer equation. The sum of this prayer is greater than the parts. There's a synergy and an authority when we agree in prayer with one another. So I'm not just challenging you to draw a circle, I'm also challenging you to form a circle, a prayer circle with other people. You've got their back and they've got your back. You lift their arms and they lift your arms. You believe with and for each other. Form a circle, draw a circle, let the games begin.